So let's talk about some of the design consideration and how you can tweak your, uh, how you can tweak the configuration for your deployment. So let's look at the management subnet first. And when we talked about the cooperative control protocols, we mentioned a protocol called AMRP, Advanced Mobility Routing Protocol, which is basically used for all the APs to communicate with each other and also enables sharing of, inform of information for client sessions, roaming cache, uh, and everything that needs to be there for a client to successfully roam from one AP to another and keep their sessions up and running. The sharing of information is by default done in two ways. Uh, first, it's done over a wired layer 2 Ethernet broadcast, and then it's also embedded in the beacon frame uh, that the AP is sending out, and all the APs that share the same hive key and can hear that beacon frame will be able to obtain that roaming cache information. Now that is the default configuration and as you can see on the screen we have a large network deployed, uh, client connected to AP1 and all the client, the client information, the roaming cache information, the session state information is shared between all the access points connected to this network because they're all part of that same management subnet. What if you want to maybe cater for a very large management subnet and you don't want to have ne a negative impact of a layer 2 broadcast? So when you talk about a layer 2 broadcast on the Ethernet side, obviously when we're talking about a large network, uh, network or large, large subnet, that means bad news. So we would normally recommend to implement a management subnet for extreme cloud IPs um, either as a slash 24 or smaller, but in some cases you need, you don't have that option. You need to have a larger management subnet implemented. Well, in that case, to avoid the negative effect of layer 2 Ethernet broadcast on the wire, you should disable the sharing of information over layer 2, uh, layer 2 broadcast on the management subnet and only keep the exchange of information over the radios, over the um, AP beacon frames, uh, and that will keep the exchange of roaming cache only between the next hop neighbors, only the access points are actually within range of each other. Uh, and what that, what that does is, because mm, it's impossible for all of the access points within that management subnet to hear each other, you will limit the exchange of information only to a very small subset of APs and you can scale infinitely. Uh, and that is the purpose of this uh, exercise. So for very large subnets, uh, you can see the example on the screen, the access point uh, that the client is currently connected to is number one. However, AP number four is still, is still within range of AP number one and will still receive the client roaming cache information, whereas the AP5 is out of range and will no longer receive that client state information. So if you compare this to the previous image where every AP would receive um, the client state information here, we're limiting that to an RF domain. And that makes it more controlled and it scales better for larger management subnets. What if you slice your management subnet into smaller subnets? So here we have three management subnets subnet A, subnet B, and subnet C. The, in this case, if you only enable sharing inf of information over Ethernet and you don't enable sharing information over radio, uh, you won't be able to get a roaming scenario between subnet A and subnet B. So in this case, um, and this would be the preferred way of deploying it, use the default radio enabled and subnet exchange enabled and the AMRP protocol will take care of everything for you. So the preferred scenario for your deployment would be have multiple smaller subnets, enable both radio exchange and subnet exchange or layer 2 Ethernet broadcast exchange of information and the cooperative control protocols will figure all of this out for you. The other consideration of why you need the radios to exchange information is when you have layer free roaming. So the scenario that we just had, uh, we in the previous scenario there was no layer free roaming consideration because everything was part of that same layer two subnet. Um, 
right now what we've done is we've sliced this into three different subnets and now when you go from AP3 and we roam to AP4, it's a layer free roam. So you roam across a layer free domain, uh, which means you need to cater for exchange of information between AP3 and AP4. Uh, and that's why it's important that in this case, because the layer 2 Ethernet broadcast will not reach AP4, you have the radio uh, exchange enabled. And again, it's enabled by default. So the AP3 will exchange the roaming cache information with AP4. And when the client device roams to AP4, AP4 will be able to build a tunnel back to one of the access points in subnet A and keep the client uh, IP address intact and all the TCP IP sessions will still continue. In this case, so why this is an ideal scenario? Well, within the subnet A, you have layer two exchange of information. Everything happens in that same broadcast domain. And between AP3 and 4, you have exchange of information over the radio. Um, and this would be the ideal scenario to deploy extreme wireless cloud. Now, by enabling or disabling radio and ethernet exchange, you do have maximum flexibility in terms of what kind of management subnet you want to deploy in. But ideally, you would have multiple small management subnets and that caters for all of the different scenarios from scaling, from layer two roaming to layer three roaming. So all of that is then supported and it makes it very easy to manage and deploy and it all works out of the box. You don't have to configure everything. So let's take a look at a design scenario and based on what we now know, see how we can optimize it for the best possible deployment. So after you do the Wi-Fi uh, site survey and determine how many APs you need and where they need to be, uh, let's consider this three floor building. And this three floor building, what we want to implement is three different groups of users. So we have one group of employees, maybe they're in marketing, one group of guest and BYOD devices, uh, in VLAN 10, and we have employees, so we have employees in, in group 1 in VLAN 4 and employees in group 2 in VLAN 5, and these are maybe two different departments uh, in the company. Then we have a management subnet, which is VLAN 2, and what we want to do is, um, each of these VLANs is a slash 24, and it needs to be available on all three floors, and the VLAN subnet in this case is going to be a slash 23. The access switches, uh, they all support all four VLANs across all three floors and they're connected to a distribution layer free switch that uh, basically has support for all the uh, VLANs and all the subnet and layer free IP information configured as well. From what we've learned uh, for a slash 23 management subnet, we probably want to turn off the uh, Ethernet exchange for the roaming cache information. So that's how we um, that's how we best utilize or how we mitigate the effect of layer two broadcasts from the AP management interface and only keep the uh, radio range exchange. We want to achieve layer two roaming everywhere uh, because with layer two roaming, we will ensure that there is no tunnels being bu built back. We're not causing any additional loads on the AP, load on the APs, and we'll basically be creating the most efficient deployment as we can, and also supplying tremendous scale. Because if you want to scale out this deployment, it's going to be much simpler uh, to do so this way. Now, doing it this way requires more front-up planning, may require you to configure your subnets and your switches, but if you can do it this way, this would be the goal. So the goal is to uh, maximize the amount of layer two roaming and uh, the goal would also be to um, allow for subnet sizes um, of slash 24 in this case. All the access points that we've discussed so far are connected to one of the layer two access switches. Now what about if you want to deploy wireless mesh? Well the good news is any extreme wireless cloud AP can mesh with any other extreme wireless cloud AP. The only rule is uh, they can mesh with access points in the same subnet. So that's something you need to be mindful of. The access point that you want to mesh together will need to be part of the same subnet. 
And uh, when would you use mesh? Well, you would use mesh in three different scenarios. One would be uh, for backup. So if your wired uplink fails and you still want to provide connectivity, you could use the mesh as a backup link to your uh, distribution system. The second one would be you use mesh in environments where you cannot, gap, you cannot get the Ethernet cabling to. Like in warehouses when you want to deploy access points on the ceiling very high and there's no way to get cabling there at a, at a, at a reasonable cost. So that's, how you, that's when you use mesh to use the mesh backhaul to connect back to the distribution system to where your servers are. And the third scenario would be in point-to-point -point link scenario. So in extreme wireless cloud, um, when we talk about mesh, mesh and point-to-point -point links, uh, they, o they only differ in the types of antennas you use. So when you're, gonna de when you're deploying, say, a point-to-point -point link between two buildings, you actually configure them to mesh, but you use directional antennas to direct the signal from one building to another. But the configuration-wise, is the same thing. Uh, mesh is disabled by default, so you have to enable mesh. And you can enable mesh on either 2.4, 5 gigahertz radios, uh, or both. And for each of those radios, you can then have client access and mesh, or just dedicated mesh backhaul link. And the considerations here are, the 2.4 gigahertz um, is going to travel further. And if you have a point-to-point -point link, uh, maybe you get you know, better uh, SNR that way. Um, and when you're considering whether or not to enable client support on the radio, know that this is a half duplex medium. So if you enable mesh and clients on that same radio, the performance of that mesh link will degrade. And also the performance of the clients will be affected as well. So if you enable both mesh and client connectivity on that radio, uh, please do not uh, plan for very good performance. Uh, normally what you would do, you would either enable mesh on 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, more often on 5 gigahertz, because it's cleaner, and then the other radio would be used for client connectivity. If you're using dual 5 gigahertz access point, one of the 5 gigahertz radios, radios can be used for a 5 gigahertz mesh backhaul, and the other one for 5 gigahertz client connectivity, giving you the best the, for both types of connectivity. So, the things to remember, mesh needs to be turned on, it's not turned on by default, and the access points that you're meshing together need to be part of the same management subnet and they need to, uh, sh they need to have access, they need to be able to exchange the cooperative control protocols with one another.